Hi, I'm Melina Wang, and welcome to Discovering China. On this week's show, the story of Kangxi, the longest reigning emperor in Chinese history, the struggle of a traditional Chinese belief system to survive under communist rule, and kung fu masters show off their skills in Taiwan. In this episode, Margaret Tri introduces you to another famous figure in Chinese history. Emperor Kangxi of the Qing Dynasty was the longest ruling emperor and perhaps one of the most cultured emperors. He ruled China for more than 60 years and established many long-lasting political, economic, and cultural legacies. Emperor Kangxi, the second emperor of the Qing Dynasty, is perhaps one of the most cultured emperors in Chinese history. He ruled China for more than 60 years and had a strong passion for learning throughout his life. Emperor Kangxi was known as a diligent ruler who cared about his people. During the last years of his rule, instead of imposing heavy taxes on the peasants, he didn't tax them at all, since there was surplus money in the imperial treasury. Under his benevolent rule, China prospered and a dynasty was stable. NTD 2012 dance competition male adult division silver medalist Chao Yongxing portrayed Emperor Kangxi in his dance routine. Kangxi was the emperor who ruled for the longest in Chinese history. He ascended to the throne at a very young age. When he became emperor, there were several powerful officials at the Qing court who were not satisfied with him. And because he was so young, it was hard for him to rule properly. After a lot of effort, he broke away from their influence and genuinely ruled as the emperor. Emperor Kangxi took the best of his three ancestral heritages. From his Mongolian grandmother, he learned practical life experiences and later the Mongolian language from a palace attendant. His father was Manchurian and his mother was Han Chinese. The young Kangxi learned horse riding and archery from a Manchurian master and Confucian teachings from a Han Chinese teacher. His courage and determination were influenced by his Manchurian culture his wisdom and noble spirit by his Mongolian origin, while his benevolence came from his Chinese Confucian upbringing. His openness and passion for learning was partly influenced by Western culture. All this molded him to become one of the most cultured emperors in Chinese history. Chao explains why he chose Emperor Kangxi in his character portrayal during the dance competition. I feel this historical figure is very good to perform on stage because he had the glory of becoming the emperor, then the downfall of the hands of officials, and then finally regaining that glory and honor when he did finally rule properly. According to ancient texts, Emperor Kangxi was able to read and write at the age of five. Every day, he would write thousands of words as constant practice. When learning the four books of Confucianism, the young Kangxi would memorize every character. After ascending the throne at the age of eight, Emperor Kangxi became even more dedicated to his studies. The books he read included the Book of Changes, Annals of Zhuo, Documents of the Elder, and the Book of Oaths. Later, he studied mathematics, geography, and science from the Jesuit missionaries, some of whom became his trusted advisors. After getting rid of the officials who had thwarted him, Emperor Kangxi recruited Chinese scholars to help him transform his rule into one based on Confucian teachings. His promotion and support for Chinese culture and arts helped him to win over the scholarly elite and also the Chinese people. Emperor Kangxi had a deep appreciation for Chinese literature and history. He loved Chinese calligraphy, wrote many books and over 1,000 poems. He was meticulous about keeping historical records and employed Chinese scholars to compile the Kangxi Dictionary, the greatest to date. 
He also mapped much of China. Emperor Kangxi conducted multiple inspection tours, one of which was immortalized in a set of 12 scrolls called Picture of the Southern Tour. These tours stabilized Manchu rule throughout China. To the Chinese, the name Kangxi now represents the stability and culture of one of the greatest periods of Chinese history. Last week, we brought you coverage on Falun Dafa, a traditional Chinese meditation practice persecuted by the Chinese regime for more than a decade. One Taiwanese, a former convict, tells us her story of meeting Falun Gong practitioners when she was imprisoned in China and how their kindness changed her life. I really thank her for helping me get on the right track and starting a new life. Dan Dan wears sunglasses and a hat to hide her identity. Four years ago, she was imprisoned in a woman's prison in Jinan, mainland China, for operating a phone scam. While in prison, she was forced into prolonged hard labor, and her family didn't want to have anything to do with her. At this most bitter time in her life, she met Falun Gong practitioner Chu Xiaotong, a fellow inmate who was imprisoned for her beliefs. At that time, she walked over and said to me, is one kettle of water enough for you to wash? In Taiwan, you can't have experienced such bitter cold. The temperature was below freezing and each prisoner was only given one kettle of hot water per day. That day, she brought over her kettle of hot water and gave it to me to wash with. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a traditional Chinese meditation practice based on the principles of truth, compassion and tolerance. Since 1999, thousands of Falun Gong practitioners have been imprisoned and forced into hard labor. While in prison, Chu was kind towards the Taiwanese prisoner. She helped Dan Dan to overcome the daily problems of life in prison and lived up to Falun Gong's principle of compassion. Chu gave Dan Dan this booklet as a birthday gift. Dan Dan says Chu was an intellectual who had worked as a civil servant. Chu told Dan Dan that she and her fiancé were planning to get married. For the Chinese regime's policy of persecution of Falun Gong, she was sentenced to eight years in jail without her family's knowledge. Once, other inmates kicked Chu all the way down the stairs, down five floors. In the winter, Chu's nose was always red. I'd say to her, have you been sneakily drinking some alcohol? Why is it red like this? Only after I'd known her for a long time did she tell me that she went on a hunger strike and was force-fed through a tube forced up her nose. The redness was because of prolonged force-feeding. As soon as it was winter, her skin went red. Dan Dan says the prison made violent criminals and drug offenders monitor Falun Gong practitioners. One drug offender, in order to shorten her sentence, killed a Falun Gong practitioner through force-feeding, and the body was quickly cremated. Despite the harsh treatment from some prison officers and inmates, there were also prison officers with conscience. There was once a prison officer who held Chu and cried, I can't bear to see you Falun Gong people like this, being oppressed like this every day, and I can't do anything to help you. Think about it. If even a Communist Party member can say something like this about Falun Gong practitioners' plight, then what are the practitioners themselves feeling? For people like me, we're in prison because we committed crimes. It's correct that we are punished since we did commit crimes. But for the Falun Gong practitioners, they definitely didn't commit any crimes. And what's more, they're such a sincere and beautiful group of people. Dan Dan says the prison tried to stop her from seeing Chu too often and warned her not to have any contact with Falun Gong practitioners. In September 2012, Dan Dan was released and returned to Taiwan. The first thing she wanted to do was search for Chu, who should already have been released. Someone who has been so kind to me, how could she end up like this? I have heard absolutely no news about her whereabouts. Once Falun Gong practitioners are released, they are taken by the secret organization, the 610 office, and not seen again. Have you heard about this? This is a situation. I also don't know much, and I fear for her. After her release, Dan Dan read news articles about the Chinese regime performing forced organ harvesting on living Falun Gong practitioners. This worried her. She made phone calls to mainland China and used online media to search for her Falun Gong prison mate, Chu Xiaotong. Dan Dan also went to ask for help from Falun Gong practitioners in Taiwan. She says she will stand up for what's right and find the person that she's most thankful to in her life. We now go back to Taiwan to check out the action of the 2012 National Martial Arts Meeting held in Taichung last weekend. Here's more. Lin Wen De has practiced martial arts for over 50 years. 
His body and hands are strong and healthy, and it's hard to tell his real age, 67 years old. Lin says the traditional arts of China, including martial arts, qigong, herbal medicine, philosophy, and cultivating one's inner nature, can all contribute to a healthy mind and body. In our national martial arts theories, we place importance on the fundamental skills. To put it another way, there are two aspects to these fundamental skills. One is preserving the health of your body and mind. The other is to open up your mind so that in the end, your body and mind become one, and then become one with the Tao. This is the way of traditional arts. 27 groups from North, Central and South Taiwan, comprising around 150 people, perform and share their experiences at the 2012 National Traditional Martial Arts Meeting. They demonstrate various weapons, including the knife, sword, spear, staff and whip. These martial arts exponents stun onlookers with their demonstrations of the Northern Long Fist, praying Mantis Kung Fu, Baji Chuan, Wing Chun and Golden Eagle Kung Fu. Traditional martial arts focus on skills, stance training, developing one's energy, hand techniques and internal strength. They develop the internal and external, and the hard and the soft at the same time. Thus they are suitable for the old and the young. Traditional martial arts place importance on the application of skills. Anyone from young to old can practice. The traditional martial arts are better because they have less severe moves and it's harder to get injured. And it's more than just fighting. The discipline of Kung Fu can improve people's moral character. One of the good things about practicing martial arts is it can improve a person's nature and make society more harmonious. The martial virtue we talk about in martial arts, valuing goodness and cultivating virtue, this is where the name of our school, Shan De, comes from. We hope to raise the moral values of society. Through sharing experiences with other martial arts schools, we raise the values of society. As part of its mission to promote the spirit of traditional Chinese culture, NTD Television has been involved in organizing traditional Chinese martial arts competitions and played a role in organizing this event. NTD has always been promoting traditional culture and values. In our country, martial arts are a great aspect of traditional culture. They can heal the body and preserve people's health. And so we're willing to participate. Over 100 martial artists gather in central Taiwan to let people see just exactly what traditional kung fu is. And that's all for this week, but as always, remember you can check out our show on YouTube and like us on Facebook. I'm Alina Wang, and you've been watching Discovering China. See you soon.